Get ready. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. 16-bit sports action. You can't go this on Nintendo. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Genesis Dutch. Hello and welcome to the 61st episode of the Sega Bit Swing and Report Show. I'm Barry and with me is George. Hello. And we also have the author of Console Wars, Blake J. Harris. Hello, Blake. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm psyched for this. Thanks for coming on. Um, I guess to uh, kick things off, um, uh, let's, let's sit, go around and say what we've been up to and what we've been playing, because that's something that we do- haven't done on the, law, on the show for a while. So, um, actually, Blake, have you been playing any games lately? Um, I dedicated my book to my fiance because I thought that she deserved it for putting up with me for the last few years. But if I were to dedicate it to someone else or something else, it definitely would have been Candy Crush, which pretty much (laughs) guided me through the writing of the book. Uh, And although that's not a console game, it's certainly one that occupies a great deal of my time. Um, So I will uh, uh, go with Candy Crush here. Nice. Nice. How about you, George? I've uh, last night I got back into League of Legends and I I don't think it's good because I have some exams coming up and I'm not studying anymore. I'm take, I'm like <laughs> every match lasts 45 minutes, so I'm probably gonna have to stop playing again. Oh, but no. I like the game; it's fun. Uh, I've been um, I've actually been reading the book over the past few weeks, and then uh, it, I don't know what what it was about reading on the train, but it kind of took me out of playing games on the train. So I've been uh, reading other things and um, and I'm I'm waiting to to get paid again so I can pick up maybe uh, some of the 3DS games that recently dropped in price. I believe New Super Mario Brothers 2 uh, dropped down to 30, and you know how Nintendo is with the price of their games. So I, was gonna say, <laughs> I would never consider 30 cheap, but I know. Nintendo. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so that's that's what I've been up to. Um, uh, Blake, I wanted to kick things off um, and ask what your history uh, is with video games and if you were a Sega kid or a Nintendo kid growing up. Um, absolutely. So um, in 1988, for Christmas, my brother and I, um, I have a younger brother, he's two years younger, and uh, pretty much, you know, I think what was so great about video games for this era is that it was probably the only thing that kept us friendly and uh, gave us something to do together. Um, so, you know, that's why I'll probably often speak about him. His name is Dylan and he's a wonderful guy. And so in 1988, um, Dylan and I, we got a NES from our grandparents, and I remember thinking that it was the coolest thing ever, though I had absolutely no idea what it did. I just knew that everyone wanted this thing, and I now had this thing, this it thing. Um, And then over the next few years, we really played it out. Um, We played Bubble Bobble a lot. Um, That seemed to be one of the cooperative two-player games that uh, we could really enjoy playing. Uh, Mega Man was a big one. And, uh, you know, we loved the Nintendo so much so that when the Super Nintendo came out, naturally, we asked our parents if we can get the Super Nintendo. And I very distinctly remember my father saying, no, if you, you know, if we get you the Super Nintendo, then they're eventually going to come out the Super Duper Nintendo and you're going to want that. And then the Super Super Duper Nintendo, and we're not going to fall into that pyramid scheme. Mm-hmm. And uh, somehow the Sega Genesis was a loophole to that pyramid scheme. And uh, we got that in 1992. And it uh, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. We absolutely loved the Genesis. It was the source of many late nights and many childhood skirmishes. And, uh, you know, as a kid, um, if, if you were to ask me what I planned to be when I grew up, it was not a writer. It was uh, a professional athlete, probably for playing two sports or maybe the first one to play three sports. So it was great to have a Genesis and be able to play um, the great hockey, football, NBA games. Um, and so after that, I got a PlayStation and then uh, when I went to college, I was sort of out of gaming for a bunch of years. I did play a bunch, uh, a little bit on the N64 in college. And then uh, I, I wasn't an active gamer until a few years ago when I started working on this project. And I bought a PS3 and then uh, and a Nintendo 3DS. And then more recently, I got the Wii U. Um, and it was definitely a source of, uh, in addition to Candy Crush, a source of great uh, diversion and uh confirmation that I was doing the right thing uh, by writing about this because they had such a positive role in my life. Nice. So um, uh, did you ever feel like when you were a kid that there was this uh, Sega versus Nintendo rivalry or 
Because I didn't really get that from your story or from the story you just told. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. That was a bit of a macro overview. But I, I completely felt like there was a huge divide between people who were on Team Sega and people who were on Team Nintendo. And I think mm -hmm. that part of the reason that this subject matter resonates so much with me and with a lot of people our age is that for the first time in my life, I remember sort of having fragments of conscious thoughts about um, this branding aspect and that there, there was marketing forces going on in the world. And I couldn't have put my finger on at the time. But, you know, a couple of thoughts that I remember having um, that were indicative of that was I remember, um, you know, Sonic was a great game and I loved Sonic, but um, I always felt like I didn't like the, the, the Sonic was so fast and the commercials were so cool that I really wanted to be a Sega person. But deep down, I was a Nintendo person and not even necessarily out of my desire to be playing Nintendo, but I just wasn't as cool as what the brand would seem to be offering. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I strive to become a Sega person. And, uh, and the other thing I remember is I just remember feeling a lot of brand loyalty towards the Genesis, um, which is what we had. And, you know, so many times I felt like at recess, people would get into arguments about which console was better. And I would fight for my life to defend the Genesis because that's what I had. And that's just it defined me mm -hmm. um, in a way that that, you know, Coke and Pepsi and Nike and Reebok didn't at all even compare to that. Those were things I was aware of as being different, you know, different brands, but not in the way that um, the fiber of my being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the reason I asked was I like I said, I, I've. Uh gotten into gaming at around 1991. So that was in the throes of the whole console wars. Um, but I, I didn't own games in the late eighties, but I did recall that it was a more simpler, peaceful time I felt because, <laughs> you know, it'd be like, Oh, what are video games? Well, there's the old Atari stuff and there's the newer Nintendo one. And it didn't really feel like there was any uh, battle going on. It was just like, you want to play Nintendo? Yeah, sure. That looks great. But um, it, it would, it's interesting, though, that it's uh, it brings that out of kids, even though they don't understand the the marketing going on so much or, you know, which one's selling more. I was telling Al, too, when we had him on that uh, I, I wasn't aware of any of the stuff going on in console wars, you know, but it's 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 interesting. Um, no, not at all. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Lance Parker, who writes for Thought Catalog, uh, made an analogy that I thought was really spot on. He said that reading the book was like. Um, watching a movie that you'd enjoyed as a kid, but realize now when you watch it again that you didn't understand it at all. Um, yeah. And sort of exactly. just that experience that you knew that the movie was fun and you knew where to laugh and you did genuinely enjoy it. But as an adult to watch something um, that had more sophisticated themes and bigger um, battles going on, you know, it's, it's nice to actually start to connect the dots and realize, Oh, that's why this thing happened. Or that's why I was driven to play that game or this system. Yeah, and it definitely pulls things out of that childhood emotion of uh, the the schoolyard wars and much more puts in a real-life adult kind of uh, situation that makes sense to us in today's world. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, George, did you have any questions about – Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, uh, what was your favorite Sega Genesis game? It, like one that made you buy the console at least. Um, well, the console was actually – given to my brother for his birthday. So even at the beginning, there was always this weird thing where, you know, we were obviously going to share it, but it was technically his. Um, so there was no system seller that brought it into our house. But the game that really um, I mastered and spent hours and hours playing was NHL 94. And, and that was what a few years ago um, I started playing again and got me into this whole project. Um, but it was really the sports games and uh, and probably Sonic 2 and Toe Jam and Earl that I liked best of all on the Genesis and that I could just become hypnotized with for hours on end. Nice. Uh, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Um, it was, you know, it was a really unexpected journey for me, and I think that's part of what made it so fun and continues to make it so fun. Um, so a couple of years ago, actually, it was uh, December of 2010 for my uh, – birthday my brother got me a sega genesis which is what we had you know i hadn't played this in 15 years or so and uh, i expected that when i picked it up it would sort of it would be fun and kind of nostalgic and kind of sweet and bring back those memories which it absolutely did um but when i was holding the controller in my hands and playing nhl 94 
um, I, you know, it started to feel like more than that. It was not just the fun memories, but it just reminded me what a gigantic part of my life video games were. And back then I felt like it wasn't about being a gamer or a non-gamer. You were just a kid. And if you wanted to survive uh, in the social world, you played video games and you appreciated video games and you swapped secrets um, with the video about video games. And so, you know, that just sort of got me thinking about what a gigantic role video games played in my life. And I wasn't even someone who would consider myself a particularly active gamer at the time. Um, and, and then, you know, as I started to think more and more about this, um, I saw that movie, The Social Network, and uh, my girlfriend, now fiance, she, um, we were talking about what we thought was sort of our generation defining um, pop cultural, technological entertainment experience. And uh, about offhandedly about uh, Sega Nintendo, and she nodded and was telling me about how she used to play Mario and what a big part of her life it was. And I guess I was naive not to realize, oh, of course, girls in Missouri also played these games. But, you know, that just sort of expanded my universe and made me realize there's probably a lot of people um, who did this. And I knew that, you know, as a fact, but not really on a very conscious level. And from there, um, you know, sort of what we were talking about earlier, where all of this was going on and we were soldiers in this battle without even really realizing what the stakes were and what we were fighting for, per se, um, I just wanted to know what was really going on behind the scenes. We were, we were so young and there must've been some really fascinating um, business strategies and behind the scenes drama. And maybe even um, the violence in the video games mimicked some sort of physical feuds or verbal feuds between Sega and Nintendo. And so um, I went to uh, the Barnes and Noble on 86th street in Manhattan. And I was looking for the video game history section. And uh, I was looking at the film history section, the music history section, but couldn't find the video game history section. And I asked the woman at the information desk where that was, and she pretty much laughed in my face. Um, and I said, all right, well, can I just get one of the books on Sega and Nintendo or those companies? And um, <laughs> again, I got some sort of blank stare and a smirk. And, uh, you know, and usually there, these people uh, are, very uh, happy to order the books for you, even though you think I can just order it for myself. And she said, do you want me to look it up? And I said, sure. And there wasn't even anything they can order. Um, or there wasn't anything that they offered to order. And so I was just really shocked that for an industry that is so gigantic and bigger than film and music and publishing, there wasn't a single book in the entire store that talked about the history or the business side of video games. Um, not to mention the fact that this particular period had such a pop cultural resonance with a lot of people um, our age. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, you know, th there are books on the subject and there are articles on the subject. And I began to find those, um, David Chef, um, Nintendo, the rise of Nintendo and the history of the company was fantastic. And, uh, Harold Goldberg wrote a great book, uh, all your base are belong to us, which was another story like David Chef's that sort of focused on the kinds of things I like to read um, about the people and the business ideas um, behind companies. But his book was, uh, you know, more short stories. And beyond that, there were other books out there, Stephen Kent's history of video games um, and uh, that book replay. Um, they, they were all good, but, but none of them really touched on exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And uh, things really started to crystallize for me when, I started to think um, how David Chef's book ended with Sega sort of on the rise, and that seemed to be where it was getting very interesting for me. Um, and then I saw that Tom Kalinske was in charge of Sega of America from this time period from 1990 to 96, where, which were almost exactly the years that I found most fascinating. And then after I spoke with him, I was just blown away by his personal experiences. Um, and, I, and I saw how this incredible global battle story um, could be told as a narrative um, and, and brought, brought to a universal audience through personal stakes and personal feelings from people like Tom and Al and Diane and Ellen Beth and Buzz Kirk. Um, and then I just spent pretty much the next few years hunting down uh, these former employees of Sega, Nintendo and the third parties and financial analysts and uh, putting together a story. And it, it's been the ride of my life. And I, I have honestly not get, been bored for a single second, which is so unusual. Usually you hit some kind of wall or feel like, ah, I'm just doing the same thing over and over. But with this project, there's so many fun tangents and fun angles to explore um, that I, you know, I'm even sad now to sort of be done with the book and not oh. have it right. 
Wow. Well, I mean, it was definitely well worth the effort. It was a great read. Uh, I don't know if you've read my review, but um, I definitely, I, I, it was really refreshing to read a book that was so, not, I guess, easy to digest. It, I didn't feel like I was reading a Wikipedia article or a collection of, um, uh, you know, like online articles from, you know, the early 2000s that some guy put into a PDF and shipped out and called a book. Not to belittle yeah. those people, but yeah, it, it it's a book that you could actually find at a bookstore rather than uh, if you were taking some game design class, you had to order it through some some weird college book site or something like that. But uh, thank you. I mean, that was absolutely my goal going in. Um, I thought that once I learned what these people pulled off and accomplished, these pioneers of the video game industry from both Sega and Nintendo, you know, I thought that they they were they they were owed a book that would be found in a bookstore, a book that would be compelling to anybody, um, that, a book that was really easily digestible, even though it did contain a rich amount of information and facts. And so I sort of set the goal was to create a book that was rich and dense as Disney War, but that read like the Da Vinci Code. Um, and my ideal reader in mind that I would always think about if I ever got stuck or if I didn't know how to frame a chapter was my grandma, who knows absolutely nothing about video games other than that from ages 7 to 14, they were at the top of my birthday and Christmas list. Um, and I thought if I can make her appreciate the story and appreciate these characters, then there's, a, there's an audience out there that will really um, connect with this subject matter, regardless of their um, you know, previous experiences with video games or how they how often they play them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. George, uh, you, uh, you talked about how you uh, interviewing a lot of people, like uh, how long did the interview process take and uh, how did you go about making a co- cohesive narrative? Um, that's a good question. So how it started for me was, uh, you know, I, I became really fascinated by this um, Sega era, this um, rise and fall um, era of Sega, which was around 1990 to 96, or basically the the release of the Genesis in 89 to the release of the Saturn in 95 and Tom's leaving in 96. And so once I sort of zeroed in on that being the area that I wanted to explore, just primarily out of curiosity at first, um, you know, the only thing I could even find on the entire internet um, about the subject was the history of Sega uh, written by a, a writer, Travis Foz, and I contacted him, and I saw that in his article there was a quote from Tom Kalinske, and I didn't know if that was one that he um, was just reposting or that he had spoken to Tom himself, and I asked him if he could introduce me to Tom, and he did. Um, and so Tom was really the first person that I spoke with at length. Um, you know, I, I pled my case to Tom on why I thought he should speak with me, even though I had never written a book before, and I um, had – Screen, had been a screenwriter with no uh, produced screenwriting credits. Um, but Tom, as you see in the book and as you know from his reputation, is just an incredible guy, an incredibly generous guy with his time. And so we spoke. And uh, and before you know, before I get into how I uh, conducted the interviews and started speaking with other people, um, just speaking with Tom was rather incredible because, uh, you know, I, I expected our call would primarily be about his time at Sega and the sort of, you know, the the interesting things that they did to compete against Nintendo and succeed and then not succeed so much. Um, But we spent like the first half of the call just talking about his years before Sega and everything he told me, it was like, wow, that guy is responsible for something that was a gigantic part of my childhood from developing the Flintstones kids, Chubal vitamins to resurrecting the Barbie line to developing He-Man on the Masters of the Universe and Popples and all sorts of other toys and then getting involved with Matchbox cars, um, I just started to think, you know, besides my parents, this guy is probably the one, the adult most responsible for shaping my childhood. Um, and, and then after I spoke with Tom, um, I wanted to speak with other people. And, uh, I, you know, at that point, I didn't necessarily think um, to introduce me to other people, and I didn't even know if he kept in touch with the people from Sega in the past. And 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 my best resource really early on was one that I had previously been making a lot of fun of, which was LinkedIn. And uh, I would just type in Sega or Nintendo, and thousands of names would come up, and I would see who was there during the time that I was interested in learning about. And at the beginning, there was you know not a single person I wasn't willing to speak with, uh, whatever job they had or whatever level they had. And uh, it was a numbers game. About 10% of them wrote me back and said, sure, I'd love to speak with you. Um, And then as I continued to do that, 
I just uh, expanded my network, uh, so to speak. And, and then also around that time, um, I, I put together an early treatment um, or draft of the book proposal to organize my thoughts. And uh, once I shared that with Al and with Tom, um, you know, that really showed them that they, it, it really impressed them and uh, made them open up to me more and sort of open the door to other contacts in that world. And it was really a great step, uh, not just for uh, introducing me to others, but also, uh, you know, Tom and Al are just the greatest and also fantastic storytellers. So once they sort of nodded and said, all right, this guy's all right, and we're willing to spend the time to speak with me, um, that just really changed the game. Oh, wow. Yeah, Al definitely is a good storyteller. I, I was nervous when we were interviewing him at first, and I just asked one question, and he just goes off and tells the most amazing stories. So, Yeah, he That's... is he's just an incredible storyteller, and you see that in the way that he approached marketing. He just, he knows how to frame things and make things interesting. And that's mm -hmm. really what Sega did. They took things that were good and made them great. And they took things that were great and made them extraordinary. And, and Al has a penchant for just thinking in that way. And it's beautiful to watch. <laughs> On the Nintendo side of things for the interviews, um, uh, like Peter Main and some of the, the big guys. Did you get a chance to interview them that uh, that much or? Yeah. Um, interviewing the, the employees or former Nintendo employees, as well as some that are currently there. I wanted to speak with was, a, was the probably the biggest challenge of the entire project. Um, early on, Peter um, made time to speak with me for about an hour, as did Gail Tilden, who was the editor in chief of Nintendo power. Um, and then I got the sense, you know, that Peter was really busy and there wasn't going to be sort of the rapport that I had with uh, Tom and Al and Shinobu and Diane, um, though, though uh, I did develop a pretty strong relationship with Gail Tilton. But uh, beyond her, I, you know, I would ask her or Peter to introduce me to people, and it was a really um, difficult process. They were certainly very cordial and friendly to me throughout. Um, but it was just really hard, and, and, not even, and even when I did um, get introduced, Two people, uh, you know, I ended up speaking also with Don Coiner, who did their advertising, and George Harrison, who replaced Bill White and did their marketing. Um, you know, at first, I just really wasn't getting the same level of storytelling from them, and, and everything was much more, uh, you know, it was less anecdote-based and much more, um, here's an overview of what happened. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe I wasn't asking the right questions, um, so, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't blame them for that, because they eventually did end up revealing a lot of wonderful stories to me, but... It was just a really tough nut to crack, and, uh, and, and as you saw from the book, I really like to tell um, anecdote and character-driven stories, so it was hard on me to, to make their world come to life when uh, the majority of what I had was, was facts and information that is more like Wikipedia entries. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I persisted. I, 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 Howard Lincoln was at the top of my list the whole time. I contacted him. I was told no. I was contacted him again. I was told no. Um, I then uh, contacted him directly because up until that point I had been speaking with his secretary, and then I was got an email from her saying, "Please don't contact him directly." <laughs> um, and, and this continued for a long time until uh, the beginning of 2013. So, in, uh, so I can tell you more about it later on. But I, you know, I ended up uh, bring, my agent sold the book proposal for Console Wars in November of 2012, and mm -hmm. uh, I quit my day job and worked on the book full time, and. Uh, then in early 2013, once I knew that the book was going to be published by HarperCollins and I knew that uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment had purchased the film option with Seth and Evan attached to write and direct. And, and basically, you know, there was a lot of things going on and that it seemed like, you know, at least from the book, there, it was going to be published and people would be in a position to read it. And um, hopefully the movie would go forward as well. So I contacted Howard again and some of the other people I'd had trouble with and said to them, um, you know, listen, guys, I, I'm writing this book. Um, it's, there's, the publisher has very high hopes for it. They're going to put a lot of muscle behind it. And you're a significant part of this story. Um, but up until this point, 95% of the information I have is just secondhand, and it's mostly from your competitors. So if you're okay with that, you know, that's fine. But I felt like as a journalist, I wanted to give you the right to tell your side of the story. And also just as a fan of what you did, I want to hear it from you as opposed, you know, I want to hear Howard talk about what it was like to be a Nintendo as opposed to having Tom Kalinske talk about what he imagined it was like for Howard to be a Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that uh, seemed to actually work. And 
led to a process that took about six months to finally get approved to speak with him. And then in November of last year, uh, I did get to film him on camera for the documentary. And that was uh, really wonderful. And, and probably, you know, as you noticed in the book, the second half of the book does uh, focus more on the Nintendo side of the world and gets into their perspective. And that was as much a, uh, a, a narrative structural thing as it was just the fact that I got a lot more access as I went along. Um, and, and, you know, I tried to make it work in the sense that I, the story begins with a date with David versus Goliath. And you just sort of assume that Goliath is this villain who has no you know, reason to exist other than to do villain. As you go along, I, I think it's important for readers to understand that there was actually a lot of reasons behind why Nintendo did what they did. And in their minds, they thought they were justified in doing that. And um, getting more into their side of the story helped um, present that other side. And I liked to expand that perspective as I went along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it worked, too. I mean, it, just in thinking of it as a movie, you know, you get you meet the villain. You don't really get to know them until probably the third act or something like that. Right. Uh, so, but yeah, that are there any subplots or stories that didn't make the cut in the book? Ah, uh, I mean, certainly. Um, since you know, I, I interviewed about 200 former Sega and Nintendo employees, as well as uh, financial analysts from that time period, uh, journalists from that time period. Um, I did a lot of interviewing with EA um, people because I was personally interested in EA Sports and and the role that that played with Sega. Um, and there was a lot of stories that were not included. Um, which, which was tough because I want, you know, everyone has their own personal stories and, and a lot of them were really fascinating, but I tried sort of with that goal in mind of making it the book that reads and goes down easy and that my grandma would read, you know, I really tried to um, keep it to things that really move the narrative forward. Um, and like, for example, one of the ones that I always loved was uh, Al's, one of Al's marketing ideas for uh, Streets of Rage 2 was he wanted to offer a contest where a child could blow up a building. Um, <laughs> and, and it was going to be, you know, I think that's a great promotional stunt, especially at a time when they had close ties with Nickelodeon. And it also sort of bridges the gap with that MTV vibe. Um, and they wanted to do this promotion. And then there ended up being some problems with uh, the licensing and documentation that you would need in order to uh, have a kid blow things up and whether or not you could have a kid do it. But I also just thought that spoke pretty highly of the kinds of ideas that Al had and that, you know, ended up not making the cut, even though it would have been great to start a chapter by saying Al Milson wanted to blow up a building. Um, Another, there was also, you know, a lot of celebrity um, based stories. Uh, Michael Jackson was obviously a, uh, a key part of Sega's initial plan for success. And uh, he often dropped by, well, not often, but there was a few times where he dropped by Sega and uh, Joe Montana would come by the offices uh, Dion Sanders, there were not, there were some not so flattering stories about, um, working with him, especially yeah. after working with Joe Montana. And, uh, you know, I, in initial drafts, I thought that, that would, those would be great stories to share. Um, but you know, cause he, cause he is a celebrity and maybe this is another side of him that people don't see when they watch him on Sunday on ESPN. Um, but you know, as entertaining as those stories were, I, I thought that didn't really further the narrative. And, uh, I thought that they would kind of get lost and slow down the reader. Hmm. Let's see. George. Is there, is there oh, any uh, specific games or, or individuals at Sega that you were curious about that, that you would have liked to know more about in the book or that I could just try to think of if there were any stories that I had heard that I wasn't able to include? Did you speak to any of the developers at all? I know a lot of them are Japanese, obviously, uh, but maybe any of the American developers. I know um, Ed. Uh, oh, man, I always butcher his last name. Ed and um, Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was, I really was so honored to tell this story um, throughout the process that there wasn't a single person that if I could be put in touch with or that I found, I was not willing to speak with. You know, if somebody said I was a janitor there for one week, I, I would want to speak to him and find out what his one week was for. Um, so I definitely made an effort to speak with developers um, like Ed, Ed Annunziato and Michael Latham. And, uh, other people that worked on the staffs and in uh, Q&A and in uh, product development. And, and then also in terms of, uh, you mentioned the developers in Japan, um, you know, th- that is one aspect of the story that I really wish I would have been able to 
explore more um, from their side of things, um, sort of in the way that I said Nintendo was a tough nut to crack, but I felt like in the end I was able to at least crack a lot of it and bring a lot, shed a lot of light into the story. Um, that's something I, I was not really able to do with uh, some of the individuals from Sega of Japan. Um, I feel like sort of a, a case in point example is uh, when I was in Japan doing um, some unrelated documentary uh, work for Sega, which I could talk about later if you'd like. Okay. Um, I got an email from from uh, Hayao Nakayama, um, which said, "I I would like you know I heard that you're trying to find me and." Uh, you know, why don't you be outside your hotel at four o'clock on Friday? And if, you know, my people think that you're vetted well, then, uh, you know, we, you can come over and we can have tea. And so I was at my hotel at four and I spoke with his people for a couple hours, uh, for about 30 minutes. And then I went over to Nakayama-san's um, beautiful home and uh, we spoke for a couple hours and it was fantastic. And uh, we stayed in touch by email and, uh, that was great. You know, I was really happy to have this connection, but every time I would ask him a question, um, he would, he would not reply to the question. Um, you know, I would say, or I should say a question about, um, this story. So I would say, how's it going? I'd get an email back uh, the next day. Everything's great. Blah, blah, blah. I'd ask him, you know, what was it like when you hired Tom? No response. I would ask him if he wanted to be in the documentary. I didn't even get a response. I asked him again. I didn't get a response. Um, so that was frustrating, um, especially because a large part of the second half of the story does focus on sort of this friction between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. I would have loved to have the opportunity to hear it more from some of the individuals on that side to hear their perspective. Um, but um, maybe in the sequel or maybe in another in another edition, if I am able to speak more with those people. Would would it ever end up being that what they didn't tell you also influenced how you wrote them in the book as a character? Yeah. Oh, that's a great point. Um, absolutely. Um, I, there, in the initial stages of the, of the outlining and the writing, there was a lot of, uh, guesswork and inference on my part, um, just to try to fill in a lot of the holes. And, and, uh, you know, sometimes this, this is something that happened 20 years ago and, uh, people are also not trying to start any fights where there need not be. Um, so if you ask somebody at Nintendo, what did you think of Sega? Uh, I think that a lot of them are more likely to say, Oh, we had nothing but respect for Sega. They were this great company and we, that we were humbled by them. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think that's how they felt at the time. And, uh, you know, it sort of was uh, incumbent on me to figure out um, whether I thought that how, how accurate I thought they were being and whether or not that their story of, their recollection of events jived with other people and Nintendo's recollection of events. Um, so that was a big part of it. And sort of my, uh, my uh, checks and balances for that was that, you know, as you saw in the book, there is, um, you know, I, I did use dialogue to try to bring the scenes to life at times. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it could be a precarious uh, decision to write dialogue for people um, like that. And, and I, would always send the chapters to the individual attorney to let me know if that was accurate to how they remembered the conversation, especially with tone and uh, just, you know, whether things were positively or negatively discussed and how things were left. Um, so, so, you know, the collaborative aspect was really helpful to me um, and, and just having the opportunity to continue the relationship with these people beyond just a simple interview or um, um, a single meeting it, that really helped, I think, add um, to the authenticity of the story and why I think that it really rings true um, with a lot of the employees from Sega Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's a rare case for, uh, I guess you'd call it, it's, you would, you would call your book historical nonfiction, correct? Right. I mean, it's, it's narrative nonfiction. Um, okay. I definitely, um, you know, wanted it to read like an error and, and because of the style that I chose, I, you know, I, I, I made sure to set, um, certain guidelines so that, you know, I wanted to make sure that anything, if there was a small talk dialogue that was like, you know, three lines back and forth that was, uh, you know, invented by me to try to mimic the tone. Um, I always wanted to make sure that anything that I took more liberties with in that regard, um, I, I spoke with the individuals themselves to confirm that that sounded about right. And also wanted to make sure that there was nothing that would end up on Wikipedia that could be perceived as a fact, um, that, that wasn't, you know, I wanted it to kind of be clear, all right, this is sort of just filler and this is sort of more of a tone momentum thing and not, you know, 
I, I would never uh, fudge or or play with facts that um, I thought were substantial to the story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what was your view of Sega before going into the project, and what is your view of Sega now? Like, how has it changed? Um, my my view of Sega before going into the project um, was probably less of a view and more of a question that I think a lot of people from have, which was whenever I told people I was working on the project, they'd say, oh, yeah, whatever happened to Sega? Um, and and most people think that Sega is completely gone now um, and, you know, don't realize that they still are. Oh, God. Successful. Well, trust, trust us, George and I as fans, we put up with that a lot. It's, it's yeah. hard. <laughs> um, and, and I, and I uh, certainly understand why people would feel that way. And I, I, I felt that way. Or, I, you know, I didn't really know what happened to them. Uh, and It'll also be interesting to see what happens with Nintendo since they're sort of at a similar crossroads as Sega was in 2002. Um, but, but you know, so I guess my I didn't really have much of a feeling towards Sega because I, I thought they were gone. And uh, but but prior to you know beyond that, all I had were very positive memories about Sega playing the Genesis, and I, I had never owned the the Saturn or Dreamcast and been disappointed when they stopped supporting the Dreamcast or anything like that. So I had positive memories. Um, and uh, I do have, you know, after the research, I have a very high opinion of Sega. Um, mm-hmm. I think that any company that has sustained success and weathered storms as both Sega and Nintendo have um, over these years is uh, pretty damn impressive, especially in an industry that changes as much as video game market. Um, you know, and I remember distinctly having a thought at the very beginning of the project that, uh, you know, it, it, under the, the concept of, the, you know, the conceit of console wars um, and this metaphorical battle between um, warring companies competing for the best technology and the best games, um, you know, I thought it was really interesting that if you thought of it as a war, it's like a war that you fight, and then at the end of five years, you sort of start over, and it doesn't really matter whether you won or lost to a large extent because you have to just go to a new terrain and, and you're, you're fighting it all over again. Um, so the fact that both companies are still around and have done a really good job of maybe, you know, maybe they haven't succeeded with the hardware, um, the way they've wanted to, or even certain types of the software, they've both done a great job of protecting their IPs. And, you know, it's amazing to me that Sonic and Mario are still as popular as they are today. Uh, and I, and I love seeing that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, as just speaking as a Sega fan, one of the one of the arguments I always throw out there is, you know, sure, they left the console market, but you look at the console world now with Sony and with Microsoft, and it just – it's inconceivable that Sega could even really survive as a console maker right now. its I mean, you just see how Nintendo, who used to be at the top of their game, what what's going on with them with the Wii U. So, um, Absolutely. I mean, one slip-up, um, you know, if you were to consider the Wii U a slip-up or the Dreamcast a slip-up, like, you know, Sega – Sega, um, even more so than Nintendo, just didn't have the financial resources to, to weather that storm. Uh, and it's, you know, to their credit, they chose, they realized that and decided we were better off just making money in software. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas Microsoft and Sony um, both have very large revenue streams coming from different types of business um, and are probably much better suited to uh, forge forward in that industry. Mm-hmm. And what I what I really appreciated about your book was that, you know, you told the larger history of these companies, too, uh, in between the narrative, which was really nice. Uh, kind of like the uh, the geeky like uh, historian, you know, stopping you while you were reading and was like, all right, well, if you're going to, you know, make a form opinions about Nintendo, here's their history. And I really appreciated that you gave uh, more than I, I expected, especially when you got into Sony's history. That was interesting. Well, you know what? Uh, I really appreciate your saying that because that was certainly very important to me. Um, I thought, you know, aside from people leaving the story feeling like they had they went on a great ride, I thought it was very important that they learned some facts about these companies and left knowing what Sega and Nintendo did and how they came to be. Um, but in terms of the history, uh, I would say the biggest influence on the writing of this book was the, the Game of Thrones series. Um, you know, that those books, um, if you think about the chapters, are really just um, most of them are single scenes or sometimes a few different scenes, and you're in the moment, and and the dialogue and the action guides you, and then uh, George R. R. Martin weaves in history and context to enhance that dialogue and enhance that action, 
and help you better understand um, what you're seeing. And then between chapters, he'll shift to a different perspective and, and it'll be sometimes the same story, sometimes different. And you'll see the same thing a little from a, from a slightly different angle. Um, and I think that doing that over and over helps build a, a, a more accurate picture of things. Mm -hmm. And that was what I tried to do with the book. And also coming from uh, just the general audience perspective, you know, like you said, people would say, oh, I, I thought Saga was gone, you know, because there's that belief that if you're not making a console, you're nothing or you're at least you've failed, I guess. Right. Um, now, if we want a, a true sense of that, I'd say you'd look at Atari. I mean, that company is just completely gutted now. It's it's a name brand only, um, which is unfortunate. But, is it um, still a name brand? I don't even. I don't, never, I don't think I've ever seen a game. I, it might. Oh. Last I remember was Ghostbusters, uh, but that was a while ago. Wait, what was the name of the? Which company did you say? Oh, Atari. Atari. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought they got divided up and they were sold to uh, another company. But um, I mean, just in the context of Sega, it's it's still a company. There's still people who work there. They make games. Um, they may not make consoles, but you look at their their long history and they've only made consoles for a good uh, 18 years, you know, which we're, we're actually coming up on. Uh, they've been a third party publisher for just about that same amount of time, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, it's really interesting to think of. Um, I remember one time early on in the process, um, I mentioned to somebody from Nintendo, um, they, they asked, what did, you know, how did Sega perceive the battle? And I said, you know, they looked at it as sort of this epic struggle, this David and Goliath, they said to me, really, what? David and Goliath, were they the David or the, the Goliath? And I said, what are you talking about? And you guys had 90 plus percent of the market. And they said, yeah, but Sega had been around. They knew how to make video games. They had made arcade games for several years. Nintendo joined the market later. Um, so it was interesting to see that perspective and also just in the context of, yeah, you know, Sega has been around for almost 50 years now. And uh, they they only made consoles during a short uh, you know, during the less than the majority of that. And I mean, the, the years that they were active, they've made some pretty amazing consoles. Of course, there were uh, a few slip ups that did uh, come in towards the end of the book. It was kind of a bittersweet ending um, with the 32X yeah, well, and the Saturn. Um, uh, George, you did have a question about Nintendo. Oh, yeah. While Nintendo, uh, while, uh, Nintendo in the book wasn't a villain, but they didn't come off that well as a you know, lovable company that they put up the front. Um, what was your opinions on Nintendo's practices? Um, I think that, you know, I think that there was a lot of justification behind what they did. Um, you know, whether it was um, restricting third-party licenses um, and just a lot of the controlling practices they did, I think, um, were oftentimes for the greater good of the industry. Um, but that term greater good doesn't usually sit well with people who are involved in being told what to do. Uh, I think that one of their bigger problems um, is, is, I guess I would say, the bedside manner of which they did it with. You know, um, for me, what was a, a bit enlightening and, and helped uh, sort of uh, confirm for me that my inferences seemed to be on the right track was speaking with uh, people in the financial analyst community and uh, video game journalists from that time period, which, you know, had a more objective stance. They did not work for Sega nor Nintendo. Um, and, and the predominant, um, the predominant uh, response from them when I asked what was, you know, it like, what, what was Nintendo's position in the market like, and how did they treat um, those around them? And they said Nintendo, ha Nintendo had you by the balls, and they knew it. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of them said that, or some variation of that. And uh, you know, with Nintendo's staggering success, they definitely had you by the balls. Um, but there is a way to go about doing that where you don't. Um, don't rub it in or, um, or at least try to make it seem like, um, maybe the situation isn't as, uh, uh, isn't as one-sided as, as it really was. Um, and, and I think that that, uh, bedside manner really came into play, uh, on, on levels that we didn't see as kids with the third parties and with the developers. Um, you know, a lot of them that I spoke with were hoping that somebody would come in and destroy Nintendo. And, and to some extent that was a self-fulfilling prophecy, or at least it led to them being much more receptive and helping Sega or helping um, even NEC uh, with the term graphics to, to try to, uh, to help so have someone dethrone Nintendo. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a certain portion of that was that competition is good for the marketplace and helps their bottom line. But I do think that there was an emotional component to them that, um, you know, I, I was looking up some numbers uh, yesterday and uh, look, going through David Sheff's book again. And it, Nintendo in 1989 um, accounted for nearly 25 percent of all sales in the toy industry, um, which is amazing because they didn't take up 25 percent of the store. And, uh, you know, they were years before just a small company. And they also, of the 30 top-selling toys in 1989, 25 of them were Nintendo or Nintendo-related products. Um, and that, that is, you know, is something that you don't see today um, from any company in any industry. And uh, that, that, you know, that's just amazing. And, and it's amazing that that was the context that Sega and Al and Tom stepped into and had to fight against. Hmm. George? George, oh, um, yeah. so let me ask you, you know, you were talking about uh, the portrayal of Nintendo in the book. How, how would you uh, categorize the way that they were portrayed? And, and how would you feel if you were a Nintendo employee currently or formerly uh, reading that book? Barry? <laughs> oh, you, you want me to answer it instead? <laughs> I um, haven't finished the book yet. I can't answer okay. it. Oh, right, right, well, right. I, I, I mean, along the one those lines... You know, I, I will say that the depiction of Nintendo was something that I was very sensitive to and, and very, I, you know, I was hyper conscious of it. I, I wanted to do a good job while dealing with the challenges of not having the access that I wanted. And even at the end, when I did, when doors opened, they weren't as wide open as they had been. And, and it wasn't a three year long relationship like I had with a lot of the folks from Sega um, over that time period. And, and, and in, in your review, um, Barry, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing that, that made me smile the most was uh, how you described the treatment of Nintendo um, from your opinion, you know, that you thought that it was fair and that Peter and Howard were portrayed in it. And uh, given their uh, time in the spotlight and they certainly weren't the central part of the narrative, um, but that when discussed, it seemed to be, um, you know, it seemed yeah. to be fair. And that meant a lot to me that, you know, you were someone who rooted for Sega uh, back then and in the story and, and didn't feel like I was piling on them and just trying to take them down. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to hate Nintendo when reading the book. In fact, I was thinking, oh, man, this is really going to gonna give me some ammo. But honestly, they, you know, they made good decisions for the marketplace. It's just I don't think – I mean, thankfully, they probably weren't dealing with what we deal with now with the Internet, where the consumers probably would be a lot more knowledgeable of their practices now than they would be right. then. Uh, which I yeah. guess is to Nintendo's benefit. Um, that, that was, you know, um, before even really getting into the Sega side of the story, the, the Nintendo side um, was sort of that first experience for me where things that I experienced as kids um, that I thought meant one thing actually meant something else with the Nintendo seal of quality. Like, I thought that was just like a cute, like, Nintendo endorses this thing. Um, yeah. But I didn't realize that there was a lot, there was, a, you know, a, a gigantic motivation behind them wanting to do that to, uh, to demonstrate that Nintendo was different than Atari and also something that Nintendo stamped to show we approve this product and there are others that we do not approve and we do not suggest that your retailer um, begin selling because we're not going to support them and you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm an, I'm an Apple owner, so I mean, I, I kind of put up with that uh, it, Nintendo sort of ideals in the computer world, just, you know, that heavy control over the technology and the uh, applications that go in it. But at the same time, I, I feel the, the plus side to that. Like I've never had any viruses on my Mac. Yeah, um, no, you know, that's, I'm really glad you brought that up. That was sort of a turning point for me in um, understanding Nintendo, or at least how I wanted to portray them was mm -hmm. about them in terms of Apple. Um, cause I think, cause I've had that same experience as you. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people have, and people um, would call Apple very controlling um, and the word controlling tends to have a negative connotation, but a lot of the time it's not if, if the net result of that control is you having a good user experience and feeling like you get your money's worth. Um, though, you know, there are certain downsides to that, and uh, those seem to be the ones that people talk about. But, uh, you know, for the majority of the things that Nintendo did, I do, do believe that they felt like they were doing the best thing for the industry. I don't think that they were um, trying to take advantage of anyone or trying to hurt or single out um, specific individuals or companies, even though um, others maybe felt that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Apple really is a good parallel. Um, and, and just, you know, in terms of a closed architecture versus uh, an open architecture, and, and Apple is, you know, notoriously wanting to control every aspect of their environment. And you see that now with Nintendo. 
Um, still to this day, they, they want to have the console. They, you know, the only place that you can play a Mario game is, uh, is on your Wii or your Wii U or your DS. Um, you know, a lot of people, usually the second question I get asked when people say, whatever happened to Sega, it's going to be on iTunes or like, when am I going to be able to download Mario games? And I kind of laugh, <laughs> um, never, um, yeah. though maybe that'll change, but it's just, you know, to understand Nintendo's corporate philosophy, um, they're going to want to control every aspect of that. And, and part of it is because they sincerely believe that a, a Mario game and that, that you could download um, on your tablet would be inferior to in quality to what you would get if you bought the Wii U and played it. And there is some, you know, something almost romantic and impressive about the fact that they want you to have the best experience um, of that Mario game. Mm-hmm. Now, have you been following modern uh, consoles and uh, the behind-the-scenes sort of goings-ons since getting into the book, or are yeah, you? Kinda... Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it really uh, renewed my interest in playing games and also following the uh, industry. I certainly do not know um, the, the current landscape in terms of um, you know executives at both companies the way that I do um, and that I research Sega and Nintendo from this time period, um, mm-hmm. but just more in terms of following financial earnings and uh, new releases. I definitely uh, really, um, and it, particularly in the past week, I found it very uh, saddening uh, to see uh, such bad news coming out of Nintendo. Yeah. What is your take on that? I don't want to get too off, off topic from the book, but I uh, want to know um, your opinion. So I actually, you know, um, I was asked by, uh, uh, by Forbes today, um, what lessons do I think that Nintendo could learn from looking at the Nintendo that I, you know, researched in the book? Um, and I thought, you know, all right, if someone from Nintendo read this book, what would be the best lesson? And I actually thought the best lesson was um, the lesson that Sega learned or experienced, um, and you know, towards the end of the book, and especially with regards to the 32X. Um, you know, I thought there were some similarities between um, the 32X Sega releasing the 32X and, and their lack of success and Nintendo with the Wii U. Cause you know, on a surface level, the 32X is a fine product. Um, it just didn't have the, the right library. It was very costly. And, and most of all, I thought it was just very, I remember as a kid, not understanding, is this a new console? Do I, do I need to have the CD for this to work or yeah. what games can I get that work on this? And I think Nintendo to some extent with the Wii U is going through a similar uh, messaging and branding issue of what, what is the Wii U supposed to be? And what, what is, how does this tablet play it? Is this supposed to be for the family or is it supposed to be for kids? Is it supposed to be the gaming system for non gamers? Um, and, and I think that that's really a problem. Um, especially when Microsoft and Sony are doing so well and, uh, people I guess have shorter attention spans. You want to know what, what is Nintendo trying to sell you and why should you buy it? And, um, I think it's, you know, they, they, they maybe want to refine and simplify that message uh, and to help turn things around. Um, um, you know, that's a very easier said than done <laughs> proposition. And also, you know, I'm oversimplifying it, of course. Um, but that was just sort of my uh, superficial take of what I thought Nintendo could learn on this situation. And um, I, I will admit that I had a lot of trouble over the past two years dealing with uh, Nintendo corporate with gaining access, but I want absolutely nothing but the best for Nintendo. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I grew up loving Nintendo, still love the characters. I still think they make great games and I, I really want to see them succeed. Yeah, it's going to be Blake, tough. Uh, uh, what's your favorite Nintendo franchise? Just wondering. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I was like, became absolutely addicted to Mario after seeing Mario three in uh, the wizard. Hmm. Um, something about just the way that that was teased. And I think I also had a really big crush on the girl that was in the movie. Um, like, you know, ever since then I've really loved the Mario franchise. Um, I also, and Mario Kart, which is kind of an offshoot of the Mario franchise. I, I really loved. And then the other one that I really did enjoy back then and also just played through all the games or at least all the ones that were available on the virtual store in the DS was the Mega Man series. Um, that those were my favorites. What about you? Uh, Nintendo franchises. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is going to be weird. We never talk about Nintendo. Yes. Um, uh... <laughs> Donkey Kong. Uh, Donkey Kong. Uh, when I was younger, uh, my mom used to buy them for me for like Christmas. Mm-hmm. So I used to like those games. I would play them the whole year and try to beat them. Um, and I actually, I yeah, some... Mega Man probably too. Um, yeah, Mega Man was really fun. 
Um, and I had a question. Is Super Nintendo X? Wait, what did you the say? X? Do you play the X games on the Super Nintendo? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Oh, it's just like an upgrade. They're trying to make them more extreme and more adult, I guess, or teenager at least. Gotcha. Hmm. Um, I, I had a question that I've seen about recently, and I'd love to get your guys' take on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I was playing the Wii U, and, and don't worry, this conversation doesn't necessarily need to be Nintendo based. Uh, <laughs> we can pull it back to Sega, but I was, you know, I got the Wii U for my birthday this past year, and I was playing Mario, and I realized after playing for about two days, I had like 46 lives. And I was thinking, like, what? Like, me beating this game is really just a matter of time at this point. Like, you know, I have so many lives. I'm not going to run out and die. Uh, and I, then I remembered playing the first few Mario games and how I felt. I think I played for several months, and I don't think I beat any of them. Um, I felt like, when did this start to change? Not just with Mario games, but games becoming, uh, you know, beatable if you put in the time versus sort of just these these uh, puzzles that you had to unlock. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's specific to Nintendo, um, but I feel like a lot of the platformers changed in that way. Um, do you guys feel similarly? And if so, when do you feel like that began to change? Um, yeah, I definitely feel that... Uh, I, I think there was a shift probably around the Dreamcast era. Okay. Um, just at least looking at it from the Sonic standpoint, uh, yeah. you know, you you die three times, you get the game over screen. If you play well enough, you get a few more lives, you still get the game over screen. Um, I don't believe I actually completed any of the Sonic games outside of Sonic 1 in a single sitting when I was a little kid. I'd have to use codes and I'd have to to get to the cheat screen. Um, I guess moving into the... I, I didn't really play the Saturn N64 era at the time, but looking back at those games, they were also very unforgiving. Um... But I, I really do feel, yeah, that it was just around when I think I think what it was was when story became just as, if not more important than the gameplay, that they made it a lot more forgiving because they wanted people to get to the next part of the story. You know yeah. what I mean? When yeah, cut, no, when cutscenes came into play, I think. Good point. Um, and also, um, George, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you loved the Sega Saturn. Um, did you own a Saturn at the time, and was and why do you think that you know you had such a love for the system that a lot of other people felt differently about? I I don't know why. Maybe it's because uh, when I got it, nobody I ever met owned a Sega Saturn. I guess it made it kind of <laughs> unique. And uh, at the time, I was really into Japanese fighting games, especially 2D games. And uh, Sega Saturn played them the best. Usually, better loading than the PlayStation One. Uh, they would look nicer than the PlayStation One. They were more arcade accurate i guess so that's why i like the sega saturn mostly for the 2d stuff at the time i still wasn't that convinced that 3d was the way to go i mean a lot of the ps1 games didn't really control that well at at least at least the early early playstation 1 games yeah yeah when reading the book too you you hear all the people at the time going oh man 3d 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 graphics and they go oh this saturn it's a piece of crap it can't do 3d and i'm like i'm yelling at the book i'm like no it has beautiful it's such a great 2D machine. I mean, sure, yeah, 2D is not the future then, but going back now and, and playing the Saturn just as a retro uh, piece of hardware, it's it's a. I mean, I think it's a beautiful piece of hardware. It may not have it where it counts when it comes to the 3D rendering, but man, the 2D I, graphics. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. So uh, there are great games for the Saturn. Why do you think that it was not as successful as they hoped for it to be? Do you think that people were just that 3D fixated, or was it a uh, marketing perception problem or something? Uh, I think it was just the, in my opinion, I think it was just the heads up that Sega, I think, I forgot who the president was at the time. He didn't release, he didn't release many of the uh, Japan uh, Japan games to America because I guess he wanted to be more... Oh, who was it that said Saturn is not our future? That's... Uh... Was it Bernie Stolar? I forgot the guy's name. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... And it's yeah. like it's obvious that Sega of America didn't have their uh, – they didn't really believe in the Sega Saturn, obviously. I yeah. think it was, yeah, the, the over-reliance on 3D graphics for just the media and I guess people at the time too. I'm sure as a kid at the time I would have been more held up on the 3D graphics than the 2D yeah. processing. But um, that yeah. and the lack of a Sonic game. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, I was just thinking about it a little bit in regards to uh, – our conversation being on Google Hangouts, um, which I had never used before, um, and you were saying that it had better quality, um, mm-hmm. but that 
people that the part of the problem was that people, you know, either felt intimidated by or were not using the Google Plus and the Google Circles very much. And that just reminded me of the Saturn thing where, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges was um, developing for it and that the PlayStation made it so easy to develop for the PlayStation um, and, and developers had a great challenge to develop for um, the Saturn. And so maybe even if the Saturn was better or better in certain ways, it was just people had that same thing where they're like, oh, I don't want to deal with it or it just doesn't seem very intuitive um, whether or not that was true. That was the impression that I picked up and I guess I was just reminded of when we were logging on to the Google Hangouts chat. Yeah, the the feeling I get, too, with the Saturn is that it's a lot more Japanese-friendly. Like, it's as though they told something to the Japanese developers that they didn't tell the American developers. <laughs> well, I think you're, kind of, you're definitely on to something with that. Because I have so many great imports. I mean, there's a – what was it, George? Is it Deep Fear? Is that the one I'm thinking of? The Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Sorry yeah. about the hard yeah, that a horror game for the Saturn. It never released in the U.S. I think it released in Europe, but yeah, very limited. But it's it's a totally playable import. It's just it's beautiful looking. I think it's um, I mean it's on par with I think PlayStation One games for sure. But it's just the fact that a lot of these really good looking games didn't make it over here either because it was late in the lifespan and America gave up or yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'd still say that the lack of a Sonic game is one of the big ones because even as a kid I was. I would have bought any console that had a Sonic game on it. And when the Saturn came out, didn't have one. It had this weird Jester game, which I did play. That's what I was going to say right now. Like, if you played Knights, you yeah. could tell, like, this would have, like, they could have worked the ninja into it that was Sonic because it, it went pretty quick, that, yeah. that game. It was I mean, pretty yeah, fast. Built by a Sonic team. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's what, like they had the engine. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did try to make a little bit of a point, uh, spoiler alert, George, uh, at the end that sort of the way that um, Knights um, was was so non-American um, and, and non-intuitive to an American audience and developed by Sonic Team um, was so different than Sonic, which was also obviously developed by Sonic Team. And, but they made a really concerted effort to make sure that it was Americanized and that it was really palatable to an American audience. Um, and so I felt like that was a pretty good personification of how much things had changed. Um, and in terms of my own personal experience, you know, I, I knew very little about the Saturn until a few years ago, until I started researching this. And also I was hired by Sega of America to go to Sega of Japan and shoot some behind the scenes uh, short documentaries with, um, you know, for their re-release of some older games. Most of them were on the Saturn, uh, like Panzer Dragoon and Jet Set Radio and the House of the Dead series. Um, and I also spoke with uh, members of the Sonic team about Knights and, and their um, you know, they, their primary inspiration was Carl Jung, um, which is really ambitious, but also that's just not, um, you know, I could see why that maybe wouldn't be the most uh, digestible story for an audience that just wanted something that's easy to understand and to play, even though it looks beautiful, the game. Mm -hmm. But things really did change a lot. So these, uh, these documentaries, you were doing them for Sega, you said? Yeah, so uh, myself and my co-director, who I'm doing the documentary with as well, Jonah Tulis, we were hired by Sega of America to shoot some short films for the Sega Heritage Collection, which was the re-release of some older games like The House of the Dead and um, Jet Set Radio. I don't know if that one actually came out. Um, and we shot... Yeah, that one came out. Um, so how do you... I was going to ask, actually ask you, how do you, uh, how do you uh, get that gig to film the documentaries? Um, that was more so happenstance. I had contacted somebody um, who used to work at Sega back in the early 90s, and she was back at Sega of America again. And, you know, I initially had approached her just about speaking with her about her time there. And she said, oh, I see you're a filmmaker and we're actually looking for someone to do these films. Um, but the big takeaway for me for that was I had prior to my going to Sega of Japan and uh, doing these interviews and spending a week at Sega of Japan, uh, headquarters with the developers and with the SOA staff that accompanied us. I, I thought to some extent that Al and Tom and Diane were exaggerating a little bit about um, how difficult Sega of Japan had made things for them, or at least how much of a divide there was. I thought there might have been a sense of, in hindsight, let's let's blame the other guys for some of these problems. Um, but but going there, I still felt the friction very much firsthand. Um, I felt like there was a passive aggressive struggle between both sides trying to hurt the other. And, and I was kind of in the middle of it because I was hired by Sega of America and there with 
Sega of America employees, but we were filming Sega of Japan employees um, to make videos to help sell games that would benefit, I imagine, both sides of the company. Um, but everything, every step of the way from the room that we wanted, we wanted a room with a window so that there'd be some sort of lighting um, to them. They, they made us switch rooms for every interview. They, I, you know, I felt like um, barrier, unnecessary barriers were put in place, or at least it just wasn't made the priority that I expected it to be. Um, and, and I'm a pretty uh, easy to please person. I wasn't asking for very much, but I was just um, really shocked to see that um, – this kinds of tension that Tom and Al described still uh, persist to this day, or at least it did in my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the creators too, they really take a lot of ownership over the IPs, even uh, when it comes to, uh, I know we spoke with, um, have, have you played Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we spoke with um, the developer of that, and it's just, it's amazing how, much effort they need to go to just to get a cameo from a character. And, you know, they have to fly out to Japan, meet with the person, get their approval. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, they definitely, they, they're proud of what they do, but they, they definitely don't like, uh, they're wary of other people. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, could, I, I could, uh, understand that that would be a source of great tension. Um, and, and that's why I really did want to speak to them some more because, you know, we, uh, I'm sure we both heard of uh, Madeline Schroeder or Madeline Kneipa, known as the mother of Sonic, and mm -hmm. Al being the father of Sonic. And, and I could see how um, maybe Yuji Naka and others are thinking, what? We, we created this guy. What are you talking about? And, and, uh, and, you know, Madeline and Al deserve all the credit in the world for what they did. But, but just even the insinuation that um, others were responsible for this thing that was initially developed over there. Um, and I'm using that just as an example. I can see why there yeah. would maybe be some enmity and hostility and jealousy, um, you know, especially with things in the creative experience. Um, there's, it's such a fragile um, relationship um, that I can see why uh, emotions would be running high and, and often not spoken about. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I had a question um, in the book. Uh, you were talking about the, um, Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons. There was the Saturday morning one and the the uh, daily one, those adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. And it was stated that the reason that there were two was that Mario had one, and so for Sonic to have more than Mario was uh, a good thing. Is that is that real, <laughs> I guess? I mean, um, Tom uh, Tom told me, and Michaeline as well, Michaeline uh, – uh, Risley or Michaeline Christie, Christie, as she was known back then uh, by her maiden name, um, she she really spearheaded that project or both of the Sonic projects, the cartoons, um, mm -hmm. and and definitely, you know, um, to sort of answer your question, uh, I, you know, I sometimes have asked how 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 uh, how much of the Sega versus Nintendo battle was really an, a, a part of the day-to-day -day life in these places. And when you speak to Sega people, they a thousand percent, everything they did was, here's what we're doing, what's Nintendo doing? Okay, we need to do better, or we need to do this because they're doing that. And so it, that would definitely, you know, make sense to me that they would be uh, accurate about how they remembered that. They wanted to do two because Nintendo had one. Um, anything that Nintendo did, they wanted to do better. Um, whereas when I spoke with Nintendo people, a lot of them said, you know, it, it was not something that they talked about a lot, and, and I do think that was true to an extent, um, to the point that they, maybe they were a little blinded by it. Um, so, yeah, the Sonic cartoon um, was... Uh, I was just reminded of the story. Um, the Sonic cartoon um, is definitely a good example of Sega trying to do what uh, Nintendo don't, um, and yeah. just sort of taking that to the next level. And, and uh, you know, one of the, one of the big... Uh, things from that era that a lot of people remember that's mentioned in his book is the Super Mario Brothers movie, which was a, a colossal failure. Or I mean, it was a terrible movie. Even <laughs> trying to watch it again today with <laughs> expecting it would just be fun, I couldn't even get through it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, there, there's an obvious inclination to wonder why was there never a Sonic movie, um, just because it's natural to want to make movies. And, and uh, I always thought that there was, there was no plans for a Sonic movie, that nothing... Uh, Michaeline recently sent me um, some old licensing contracts that I received two weeks ago, so after the book was done, and there was a, a deal memo for the Sonic movie, um, and, and it was much further along than anybody realized. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Any details on that? Uh, at this time, I <laughs> uh, need to review it. 
um, you know, I looked at it very quickly, but uh, it's been a busy few weeks. Um, but but when I come back on the show with uh, Darren, I'd be happy to talk about it more and let you know what um, what the details were and, and hopefully also just find out what happened because that, this was something I didn't know about. Uh, and that's kind of the great thing about this story is I, I wrote a 500 plus page book. It's not long um, and, and it, gets, it talks about a lot of things. But it's by no means comprehensive. There, there's so many interesting tangents and so many things to keep learning. And, mm-hmm. and at first, I was maybe a little upset, like, oh, I missed that. How can I miss it? Um, but, but that's just going to happen. And I've sort of come to embrace that and realize, there's, of course, there's going to be hundreds of things I missed. Oh, yeah. And, you know, maybe in a future edition, they'll, some of those things will be included. But, um, you know, it all sort of started with walking into a bookstore and there not being a single book. Um, and, and so I'm hoping that at the least this brings to the surface a lot of stories um, from that era that people can read and review if they wish to. And, and, you know, I love hearing, I, I, I don't ever want to not, you know, I always want to learn more and more about Sega Nintendo, even after this book is released tomorrow and whether or not it's successful or not, you know, I have such a personal interest in this story that there's not, there's really not much of a single thing that I could learn that wouldn't be fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you spoke too. There's a documentary in the works for Console Wars. Um, yeah, there is. What's, what's the status on that? It's one of the things I hear about, but I haven't really seen much outside of interviews. Yeah. So, um, and this, this is, should also go. You know, I mentioned to you last week um, that I was really very impressed that you put together all the pieces and realized that um, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg oh. were involved in this. Pro- Thank you. Producing <laughs> stuff going on because. Um, you know, since January 2012, I had been uh, sitting on this information and wanting to shout it from the rooftop and, and not been able to tell anyone because uh, we, we wanted to keep the project under wraps. Um, Seth, Evan, and Scott um, wanted to, and I, of course, would do anything they say, uh, given how successful they are and what an honor it is to work with them. Um, but, you know, when, the, when that news first came out that uh, Sony had bought those domain names, I thought, oh, you know, people are going to start to dig deeper and figure this out. And also, you know, speaking with like uh, some journalists in the video game industry, I thought people might connect the dots. So I was extremely impressed that you really started, you really put it all together. (laughs) And uh, I spent like 15 minutes um, on your old websites and trying to find your contact info because I wanted to send you a message to say, uh, well done, or like you got it right. (laughs) Um, That was also actually like a really funny thing. I think you posted that on a a Friday morning. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought, holy shit, Barry figured it out, this thing that I haven't been telling people. Uh, and I was wondering if, you know, other people would um, see what you had written or if other people would also figure it out on their own. And it was really interesting to watch over the next few days as the, uh, as the attention grew and more and more people started to uh, report what you had discovered, though not citing you. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a really funny situation. I mean, not just because I felt bad for you for not getting the credit um, that you deserve. But it was just uh, an, an interesting experience of where we are in this age of journalism that um, I would see uh, one site, um, you know, there was a couple sites early on that um, acknowledged you, and then other sites would acknowledge that site, and then other sites would acknowledge the other site. And by the end, it was like sites that were six steps removed were getting the credit for this. Mm-hmm. And it was just amazing that, you know, people weren't doing the due diligence. <laughs> You know, not to mention that there was also I saw some report that Scott Rudin was directing the movie and that Adam Goldberg was doing it with Seth. Um, a lot of misinformation. So I was really impressed that you uh, figured it all out. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm over not being cited. As long <laughs> as you your your thanks is enough. That's good. <laughs> Honestly, I, I I I like would update every hour and see like you know who had commented and if other. Um, places that picked it up and it was, and it was a good experience for me just to see, um, you know, the mechanics of Facebook and Twitter in motion and how the story kind of blew up and it, and it did blow up. Um, not at all because I was involved in it, but because Seth Rogen was. And by, uh, Monday, the following week, you know, it was the number one story on Reddit. The, the pre-orders of the book sales had, had done incredibly well. Um, but all of this was my long answer to saying, to answering your question about the documentary. Um, and so in uh, January of 2012, uh, myself and Jonah Tulis got to meet with Seth and Evan and uh, James Weaver, one of the other producers at Point Grey Pictures, their company. And, uh, I, you know, I talked to them about this book that I wanted to write. And uh, Jonah and I also, um, in a dream world, wanted to make a documentary based on the subject matter. And, uh, you know, that 
and 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 also I would have loved for there to be a feature film based on the book. And uh, Seth and Evan saw um, this possibility and opportunity just as we did, and uh, they, and they wanted to be involved with doing all three and to make it happen. And uh, they they called us back later that day and said, "Let's do it." And uh, from there, you know, things got really exciting and really interesting. And so we. Uh, began filming the documentary in June of last year at E3. That was our first, uh, first day of shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we went down to San Diego and filmed Bill White, who was the only executive to work at both Sega and Nintendo. And, uh, we spent, you know, off and on through, uh, from June until November, we, we did some filming and we finished, uh, our principal photography of the interviews that we had initially had on the list about 15 interviews. And now we're in post-production and uh, the film is coming out great. Oh, very nice. So will it will it be similar to the book, or is it going to tell new stories and go off in new directions? Uh, it's definitely going to go off in new, you know, there's there's definitely going to be new stories and other information. It's going to be uh, a similar scope, and, it, you know, the, the primary value and the reason why we think it's extremely important to do a documentary in addition to a book and a, a feature film is, um, one, the... Um, the unquestioned value of hearing it in these, in, in the individual's words themselves. You mm. know, I, I tried my best to uh, make it really interesting and to tell a good story and to talk about Al and Tom, but um, whether I did or not, you know, the value of hearing Tom and Al tell it is, is, uh, you know, extraordinary. And, and you should hear from their words to see what, just what words they choose and how, and what um, parts of the story they like to talk about. Um, and then the other big reason that we were that we're really excited about is just the the media from that era. Um, you know, I think that people have a very uh, strong reaction to seeing the commercials from that, as well as uh, some of the uh, footage that I was able to get from uh, the consumer electronic shows, from the Nintendo presentations, mm -hmm. and some of the uh, preparation for Sonic Tuesday. It's just you know, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, some of it was very hard to find, and some of it's just been out there, but it didn't really have uh, a narrative. Uh, spine to connect to. Um, and so we've had a tremendous fun time, tremendously fun time, um, connecting those, um, pieces with the story. Oh, very cool. Um, now in reference to the, the movie, um, is there anything you can say about that? I know, I believe they were talking about still writing the script at this moment. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's not much I can say, which is not, by gag order or anything there's just um you know i'm happy to tell you everything i know um but at this point you know we have primarily been focused on the documentary uh and because seth and evan and scott are producing the documentary as well it's sort of like every positive step of the documentary is in some way a step moving forward with the feature film um but on the same token you know seth and evan um are going to be are planning to work, uh, you know, to really get in and finish the draft of the script, um, probably in the late summer, early fall, um, as last I heard. And, and that's, you know, they're finishing Seth's movie neighbors just came out on Friday. Did great. They have another movie in post-production, the interview, um, mm -hmm. which comes out in a couple months. And then they're writing the preacher, um, the adaptation of the graphic novel preacher for AMC. Um, and then their plan as of now is to do, uh, console wars after that um you know things change all the time in hollywood um but you know i would wait five years if that's what it took to have seth and evan do the movie because i think they're the perfect guys to do it so uh whenever they can make the time you know i am uh still uh in shock that they're going to actually be the ones um doing it and let's hope it happens oh absolutely and for for both the documentary and the movie i know you know you're, you're going to be using logos and footage and things like that do you need to get i mean of course you need to get approval for those things from sega and nintendo but i i'm just i'm kind of uh wondering when the movie when it comes to the movie it's going to be pretty difficult i think to uh plaster sega and nintendo all over the place um i you know my gut reaction is that it would be difficult as well um yeah. but luckily this is uh something that is not <laughs> it's something that I would be dealing with for well, the documentary. Of course, of course. It is. Um, but you know, I, I, I honestly don't know how that was dealt with, um, in say the social network movie. I mean, Facebook logos were shown and, and other, um, IPs were presented at times. I, I don't know whether they did that with permissions or whether, um, uh, things were scripted in a way or 
there's, there were certain permissions from individuals that helped um, you know them surpass any obstacles. Um, but I honestly don't know the answer to that question, and uh, it is something that will be you know I, I hope that they are able to get the permissions. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I, I also think. Sega and Nintendo, um, it, it, I think that it would be in their best interest to embrace the um, uh, book and the documentary and the film. Uh, I think that the exposure um, is only going to help them and only going to make them more uh, profitable. And maybe they won't see that um, this way. And uh, maybe, you know, there is a temptation that even using that, going back to the example of the social network, Facebook wasn't always portrayed in a positive light. Um, and I could see why maybe the company would not have wanted to support that. But in the end, um, it did, I believe, help Facebook a lot. Um, and I think that the same would be true of Sega and Nintendo, uh, regardless of the portrayal. Um, and, and in this situation, I think the portrayal um, overall is pretty positive and it, it's trying to shine a light on these pioneers that built the modern video game industry. So... We'll see, but I really hope that they'll uh, get on board and that they'll want to be supportive. Mm -hmm. George, do you have any questions about the film? Yeah, I actually no, not about the film. I was going to say like, if he had, if you had Blake, if you had to write a another book based on Sega history, what era would you want to do it in? Uh, that's uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, at this point in time, I would be uh, really tempted to just kind of continue because I'm because I want you know. It's sad for me not to be writing more about the subject. Um, but, but uh, you know, in terms of wanting to tell, like, a very different type of story, as I would like to do as a writer, um, you know, I, I started to speak much more with David Rosen after the, the book was uh, pr mostly finished. And, I, you know, he's an extremely impressive individual and very fascinating. And I think that his formation of Sega um, and the challenges he faced and, and the reasons why it became a video game company and, you know, got into um, that kind, those kinds of products um, from photo, instant photo booths and jukeboxes, really interesting story. And especially just also an American starting a company in Japan, um, which a lot of people don't realize was that they say it was started by an American. I think that'd be a pretty interesting book to read. Like yeah. a prequel, Console yeah. Wars, the prequel. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, David is... Uh, you know, he's the man who started it all, um, and uh, I, you know, I have uh, nothing but reverence for him, and he's been uh, really kind to me and speaking with me uh, recently uh, and sending me some materials, which also I'll try to go through and see if we have anything we can talk about the next time. I think. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. He's he's one of those, you know, it's he's not going to be around forever. It's just amazing that he's he's still there. He's uh, in California, just chilling out. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, did you meet him in person or over the phone? Uh, no, I met him over the phone. Um, okay. And uh, we had spoken uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was actually going out to Japan, Akiyama san. I thought. Yeah, I thought that was really nice. Uh, you know, after all these years, um, mm -hmm. I don't. I actually don't know what the status of the relationship is, but it was just really fascinating to think they're going to be spending time together. These two guys. <laughs> What's he like too? I mean, just his personality-wise. It's it's. I've only seen photos and read Wikipedia articles. Of uh, David or uh, Nakayama-san? Uh, David Rosen. Um, uh, I, I he he's much more uh, creative and ambitious than I think I gave him credit for, and that I really understood. Um, you know, he is um, much more of uh, a visionary of sorts, and uh, he he's a. Uh, you know, definitely a, a seemingly practical guy, um, and uh, he seems to uh, you know be very cool, calm, and collected. He doesn't he doesn't ha um, you know get flustered and doesn't also seem to get you know, excited, um, which is you know sometimes hard because you you like to hear what people talk you know talk, um, you know. Whereas I think Tom is also doesn't get flustered or at least doesn't publicly get flustered, but he you know he 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 gets very excited and it's really nice to make him uh, laugh and smile. Um, mm -hmm. But David uh, was a little bit more, um, <laughs> uh, uh, a little bit more uh, practical. Interesting. Oh, I'd love to speak with him someday. I don't, I don't know if I'd ever get the chance, but uh, yeah, that that's really awesome. Uh, George, did you have any more questions? 
Mm, uh, well, I was going to ask about the Sony Pictures thing, but he. Oh yeah, man, go ahead. Too early. I was yeah, saying, you think true. Sony Pictures would affect the fi- uh, how Sony is portrayed in the film, considering that you know they're, the, they're a sub company? Uh, I genuinely do not think so at all. Um, you know, Sony is mentioned a lot of times in the book. Um, nobody from Sony ever contacted me and said, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't write that or you should portray things in this light. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think that people see the name Sony and think, oh, that's funny. Sony, you know, they're just doing this for their selfish. But, it, you know, in real life, Sony Pictures has such a small association um, with the video game development and distribution side of Sony. Um as a lot of, you know, global companies have that kind of situation. Um, and, and I, you know, also Sony plays a really small role in the story. Uh, and, and for the most part, it is a pretty positive one. I, I don't think they would see there any benefit in trying to embellish that um, or try to enhance that role. You know, Sony um, ended up winning that uh, console battle, that next war. But uh, mm-hmm. most of the book is really about the, the ups and downs of Sega and Nintendo during that 16-bit battle. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I'm also not a huge Sony fan, but it's funny because I'll I'll like them one generation, I'll hate them the next generation. I'll like the you know, it's I yeah. jump back and forth. They're very likable in this book. I was surprised by that about Sony. I mean that's probably because of Olaf. Um Olaf super interesting guy. Um mm-hmm. Really is a Renaissance man coming from a physicist background and getting into electronics and also being a published writer. Uh, in Iceland, um, you know, I think that that, that really, um, from my perspective, built up a lot of the likability um, because I find Olaf so interesting. Um, and, and I do think they come across as likable in the book. So I would imagine that Sony would be, you know, that would be a, an added reason for them to not um, feel like they would need to meddle at all because it's a positive story for them. Um, but it isn't their story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if if you had gotten into the Dreamcast uh, PlayStation 2 uh that would right. have been a different story, but um, Absolutely. Absolutely. yeah, which would would be an interesting book too. It's um, no, no, I I feel like there's a lot that's gone unsaid about that too, especially recent info that came to light where Xbox wanted the Dreamcast to be playable on the on the console, which is kind right. of surprising. Um, but that's that's another story. But, yeah, there's a lot of stories, and you know the the um the other thing that's nice about uh, hopefully, you know, bringing to light some stories just for with, uh, by my book coming out is that, you know, a lot of time has passed. So I do think people are more willing to share things that um, they weren't, they wouldn't have been. If I had written this book in 1998, I think it would have been a very different book. Um, but oh, because yeah. two decades have passed um, and, uh, you know, more secrets could be shared and there wasn't any, you know, any, 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 uh, particular items at stake that really were affected by this, it, you know, it'd be, I'm really curious to hear what else comes to light from the Dreamcast era uh, in particular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now Nintendo's kind of relying on Sega to help them win given uh, <laughs> Sonic Boom and Bayonetta 2 are two of the major games. Uh, you know, what do you guys think of that? Actually? I'm curious. Is it, is it weird for you to see Sonic and Mario side by side? Do, do you <sighs> feel good seeing them side by side? It's I've I've gotten used to it. It was weird for a while. It kind of annoyed me that the GameCube was getting these Dreamcast ports when, you know, it, it kind of made the Dreamcast feel less special that kids were like, oh, hey, man, Sonic Adventure is pretty awesome. I'm like, yeah, it was awesome when I played it in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, it's it's I've grown to get used to it. Uh, it's not Very, weird anymore. I was going to say you're like a hipster son- Sega fan, right? I guess so. Telling all the kids, I just played this in 1991 already. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sonic was cool, yeah, when I was playing it in 1991. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, the one thing is, though, with the Mario and Sonic games is that despite there being, I don't know how many, four of them now, it still hasn't really hit me because they just they just kind of stand next to each other and go skiing. Uh I I guess I'm still waiting for them to actually have a conversation and maybe actually, I don't know, punch each other. But that's what the Super Smash Brothers games are for, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. It'll be interesting. I think that part of my um, part of my uh, continued suspension of disbelief, even though I see the packaging, is uh, one of the problems that I always had with Mario, not the game, but the character, is I never really uh, necessarily understood what his personality was like. It's sort of that same 
uh, problem that I have with Mickey Mouse, where, yeah. you know, he, Mickey, Mickey is put into hundreds of different roles and the same way that Mario is the referee in the tennis game and then he's in Mario Kart, but I never really knew what he's supposed to be like. And I think that's, you know, intentional to some extent. He's supposed to fit these molds, but um, I, I feel like I don't know his personality and therefore don't, I can't even imagine what it would be like if Sonic and Mario met in an alley. Maybe yeah. Mario has a, a deep, repressed, angry side that we don't even know about. Maybe he just says, oh, yeah, it's a punch me in the face. I don't, like, you know, I just don't know him well enough. And, and I did, at least back then, know Sonic very well. Um, and, I, and I love that about Sonic. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more dimension to the character. Um, when I was growing up, my dad was a big uh, Donald Duck fan. And, um, you know, he'd always tell me, I think he was trying to get me to convert over to Donald Duck at an early age because he'd say, you know, like, Mickey's boring. And I'd be like, yeah, I guess you're right. And he's like, no, like, think about it. Mickey, there's nothing exciting about Mickey. He just laughs and smiles. He's like, Donald's a lot better. You know, he gets mad. He has frustrations. And I think it's similar to Sonic. Sonic doesn't really get mad so much as he has an attitude. He can get frustrated if things are going slowly. You don't get that from Mario. Yeah. Um, I mean, sort of, you know, whenever you write a screenplay or you write a book, um, and even when, you know, actors, they say, what's my motivation? Um, you know, creating stakes and having a motivation is pretty central to telling a story. And I, and I never felt like I knew what Mario's motivation was, I guess, you know, to save the princess, but are they like platonic friends? I, I don't really, I don't know what, what's going on. And I, and I'd love to see Mario fleshed out. I'd love to see another Mario movie actually. Yeah, I mean, meanwhile, Sonic has had over five or six television series, and he has the longest-running video game comic in the world. So, you know, it just says something. You give your character a little more personality and depth, and it goes a long way, especially in the, the uh, marketing. So. Well, down but, to a very simple thing. Um, I feel like, you know, the name says it all. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. His middle name is The, because Al thought that was cool, and it is. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, just in terms of them really um, exploring all the depth of this character, the name, you know, is a, is symptomatic of that, whereas Mario's name is, I guess, it's Mario Mario, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that lack of foresight to, like, oh, maybe we should think about what his name is, because now he has a first name and a last name the same, it's Luigi Mario. You know, <laughs> I sort of think, what's in a name? And, and that alone sort of shows the differences between Sega and Nintendo. It's all about telling a story. It is. Is. And you told quite the story, too. I wanted to thank you again so much for coming on. It was uh, absolutely my pleasure. And thank you, you know, not just for your kind words about the book, but all everything you've done to help promote the book these past few weeks. Um, as much as you're helping me, and I'm grateful for it, you know, I see it as I owe a lifetime of gratitude to the people who let me write about them. And I will do anything um, to, to help share that story and get it out there and make sure that their um, story is told and that people – admire them as they should absolutely and if you just want to take a second here i have uh four people who won copies of the book this is courtesy of your publisher um we held contests on instagram twitter and facebook so i'm just going to read the names off here real quick awesome. um the instagram winner i picked the ones that have the weirdest names but it's all random uh instagram is mukatsuku byron that's that's yeah. a good name. That's I'm going to write that one down. That um, one just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> we have two Twitter winners. There is Daryl M. Stark, and we also have Wake of Osiris, which sounds like a mummy movie. <laughs> Osiris, the mummy and the Wake of Osiris. Uh, Daryl M. Stark and Wake of Osiris. And then for Facebook, we have Jason Little, who won. So uh, those are our four winners, um, and we'll get their addresses, and they'll get uh, – I'll receive copies of the book, and if they've already pre-ordered, then they have an extra copy to give to their friends. Um, and uh, at the time of this going live, the book is out now. It's Console Wars, Sega, Nintendo, and the Battle That Defined a Generation by Blake J. Harris. So, Blake, thank you again. Anytime, and I really mean that. Thanks so much, uh, Barry and George. I've had a blast, and uh, anything I can do to help you guys, just let me know. Absolutely. Thank you.
Yeah.